Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash voices in my head. That's audibletrial.com slash voices in my head. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com slash voices in my head. Give it a try today. Welcome to Voices in My Head, the official podcast of me, Rick Lee James. I'm a recording artist, a singer, a songwriter, an author, a worship leader, and an ordained minister in the Church of the Nazarene. The Voices in My Head podcast is where I discuss music, movies, books, pop culture, theology, and more with friends, colleagues, and sometimes just by myself. Now make sure to let me know what you think of today's episode by leaving me a review on iTunes or by tweeting at me at Rick Lee James on Twitter. And please join my mailing list at rickleejames.com where you can receive an email every time a new episode is released. And by the way, in case you're interested in a daily dose of kindness and encouragement beyond this podcast, I also run the Twitter account at Mr. Rogers Say, where I post daily quotes from Fred Rogers, one of the voices in my head. Well, I guess that's it for the intro, so sit back, relax, and listen to the latest episode of Voices in My Head. Welcome back to Voices in My Head. As always, I'm your host, Rick Lee James, and I'm so glad that you're here with us for another great conversation this week. In his book, The Gospel for the Person Who Has Everything, Bishop William Willimon brings the gospel of Jesus Christ to life for the person who has everything. Happy, fulfilled human beings who don't feel the same level of need expressed by the downcast, the outcast, the brokenhearted, and the miserable. Willimon says that the church's message to the wretched and sad must not exclude the strong and the joyous. Paraclete Press has just released a brand new edition of the book, The Gospel for the Person Who Has Everything, and Bishop Willimon has stopped by for a visit this evening so that we can talk about it. Dr. William Willimon, welcome back to Voices in My Head. Oh, thank you, Rick. Uh, great to be back among you. <laughs> well, I am so glad to have an opportunity to get to talk to you again. I was trying to remember i think this is i think the fourth time that we've been able to chat over this podcast and uh and it's always yeah it's always been a great conversation and i've loved getting to know you more uh over the the last couple of years when we've gotten to do this Um, i was excited to find out that paraclete press had re-released uh the gospel for the person who has everything and i think it's really a needed um Actually, a needed concept of the book right now, uh, because it helps us rethink um, maybe repentance in a in a way that we aren't used to thinking about, and what it means to actually uh, become a Christian in many ways, and and especially in the confusing times that we are living in right now, where um, Christianity seems so politicized on one end of things, and we just get such a distorted picture of the gospel. So I'm I'm really glad to have this. Uh, in in my hands to be able to talk about tonight it's it's a good book to revisit and Hi. as i was telling you before the show i i i only have at this point um, the original copy from from years back uh, but i'm excited about the new uh, book and and even the new cover is really great on the book i love the artwork <laughs> and the style uh, that they did so it really fits well well, let's just uh, let's dive right into it. I've got a few questions for you tonight, and, and we'll just see where our conversation takes us. But in the book, you start right off writing about giving a testimony, something that many of us who grew up in church understand very well, and how we are encouraged to fit our testimony into a format of, I was miserable, then I found Jesus. <laughs> and and if you were giving a testimonial about your own experience of the Christian faith, I have to ask you, would it fit into the mold of I was miserable and then I found Jesus? Or how would you describe your testimony in light of that? Um, you know, I, I uh, 
the book arose out of my experiences as a young pastor, really at my first church. And um, I realized that I had sort of grown up with the presentation of the gospel, such as uh, you got a need and your need is this, and uh, Christ is the fulfillment of your need. He is the answer to your problem. And um, come to Jesus and get that fixed. And uh, I, one, I realized that, that that didn't quite fit my own faith journey mm. in that I don't remember growing up with a great sense of need. I grew up in a single-parent home, and there were certainly problems, challenges, issues. But I remember more than kind of my searching for God or, or my uh, struggling with some need that, that I needed help with. I, I remember my own faith journey as a sense of a growing awareness of God having turned to me, uh, a sense that I was uh, someone who had been given certain blessings and privileges, and uh, I think a sense of, of being called, a sense that God had some meaning for me, some purpose for my life, beyond my own creation of that purpose. And uh, being swept up into God's project more than God being sort of the fulfillment of my project. And so I think that sort of informed my preaching during those first years of ministry and informed the thesis of this book. Hmm. Wow. Well, well, thank you for for touching on that. I appreciate it because I think too often we do want to fit um, almost everyone into the same box <laughs> when it comes to telling their faith story. And, yeah. And in part of the book, um, you actually use a, a really um, – you, you, well, you use actually uh, what Reinhold Niebuhr called in one of the chapters. Um, you call it, uh, he called it the fallacy of moralistic preaching. And um, there's, there's sort of this summary that you talk about in the book that you say if you could sum up about 90% of the sermons in which you hear, and, <laughs> and a lot of which you've preached, you say too, um, the, the summary goes something like this. You have a problem. Christ is the answer. Uh, repent and be saved, and uh, and that's it's in that chapter that you re refer to Reinhold Niebuhr and and what he calls the fallacy of of moralistic preaching. I wonder if you could unpack for us a bit, sort of what what that fallacy is of maybe that kind of moralistic preaching, or or when that becomes kind of a steady diet of just that kind of preaching. I, I think I would define moralistic preaching as the presentation of a gospel as a kind of human assignment. Uh, what is the gospel? The gospel is something about you. Uh, you need to believe this, feel this, uh, act in this way, and the gospel of Jesus Christ basically reduced to human thinking, feeling, or action. And uh, there's a number of problems with that. One is that uh, I think the gospel is best seen as an announcement of what, of, of who God is. God is Jesus Christ, and that, and what is God up to? God is busy uh, turning toward us. Uh, God is busy drawing us into God's projects, and uh, moralism and moralistic preaching. Uh, is is sort of embarrassingly anthropocentric rather than theocentric, to put it in a kind of theological way. Sure. That is, it, it's about us and what we're supposed to do or produce in order to connect with God in the right way. I think the gospel is a story about how God has connected with us in a in a powerful way, and that it's a story not about what we ought to do, should do, could do, but a story of what God has done in Jesus Christ. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, I'm a Methodist, 
And I wonder if moralism is a particular kind of Methodist malady uh, that is, uh, who's a Christian? A Christian is somebody who believes something, who does something, who has felt something in their hearts. Uh, so I think a Christian is somebody who has simply said yes to the prior initiatory yes that God has said to us in Jesus Christ. Hmm. Yeah, that is a, a powerful thought. And I, I I get the feeling that when I read about the way that you write about about kind of the flaw of, of moralistic preaching, it's almost like like you just said, and I'm I'm kind of reiterating it, but it's starting at the wrong place because the good news is not about how messed up I am. <laughs> the good news is about this amazing God um, who initiates uh, coming to us, and and really the story starts with love. I think um, is sort of uh, like to flip it all. Would would you say that that's yeah. Um, Kind yeah, of, uh, yeah. With, with God's love, I mm -hmm. mean, to quote a verse, uh, we love, why? Uh, because God first loved us. And in the divine human relationship, it's always it's God's initiative. It's, and it's uh, again, the gospel is an announcement. Hey, uh, God is not who you maybe presume God to be, uh, for instance, God is not the one who says, hey, I'm setting the bar, I'm giving them the Ten Commandments, I'm giving them whatever, mm -hmm. and okay, humanity, chin up to that bar. Or it's not Jesus coming and saying, uh, now, now, here's who I am, now I really need you to believe in me, I need you to believe the following fundamentals about me. No, it, it's first of all a story that God is... Uh, turn to us. Uh, it, it, it's a story that I think as it's kind of beginning in Deuteronomy, uh, God says, I will be your God, hmm. and you will be mine. You will be my people. Well, that's, that's the gospel. And um, then our, our human response is always only that response. And uh, I think that's really good news because it means that my relationship to God is not dependent on uh, me. I'm, I don't always feel like a Christian. I don't always think like a Christian. Mm -hmm. I don't always act like a Christian. But the good news is <clears throat> uh, God has thought about me. Hmm. And that, that, as you say, that love, uh, any of our human love is always responsive love to that prior love, and sadly, I think that that gets obscured. It, it, uh, you know, we preachers stand up and we say, "Hey, church, uh, you ought to do this." Uh, hey, hey, people, uh, Jesus wants you to act like this. Or, uh, yeah, well, the, the trouble is, uh, and I kind of work this theme in the book. Uh, you know, it's it's the ethics of gratitude. It's it's the ethics similar to, you know, the parent. Um, I think I have this illustration in the book about, you know, there there are two ways for parents to influence their children. One is to say, look, here are the rules. Here's my standards. You need to meet up to them. And if you do, I will be your loving parent. Hmm. Uh, another way is to simply say, let's get this straight. I am your loving parent. Hmm. I will always love you, no matter what you do or don't do or which paths you take. I will be yours and you will be mine. And that means that then the child responds uh, often, uh, you, you know, by saying, wow, I, I want to be my best, and my best is to be who I am created to be, hmm. and I am loved, and that's responsive. Yeah. And uh, so it is, uh, I know, you know, the book is, is over 40 years old, and I wrote it during my first days of ministry, and um, 
I think I saw it as a kind of an, a, a, an evangelistic exercise. I think I saw it as uh, an attempt to articulate the good news in a fresh, uh, lively way. And I wondered, uh, looking at it now, when Paraclete Press approached me, I wondered, wow, I wonder, is this still relevant or and all? And looking back through the book, there, there are moments the book is dated where I talk about Oral Roberts or I talk about some contemporary uh, thing going on. Uh, however, I was, I was almost embarrassed <laughs> by its continuing relevance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I kind of argue the gospel, Jesus Christ's main mission is not about meeting human needs. It's it's his main mission is an invitation. Follow me, join up with my movement, my kingdom. Uh, become a citizen of my kingdom. Uh, well, uh, uh, th- there's a sense in which the presentation of the gospel as kind of a solution to human problems mm-hmm. uh, th- that maybe is more of a way of presenting the gospel today than it was when I originally wrote the book. Mm. Uh, that is, uh, the problems have changed. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I remember growing up, you know, the, the thing was, hey, you're a sinner. Now, uh, you need your sins forgiven. And, uh, well, preachers don't, not many preachers talk like that anymore. More often, preachers say, are you anxious? Uh, are you feeling lonely? Are, are you... Uh, feeling hopeless. Uh, well, good, so good. Now, come to Jesus, and, and he fixes that. That's why he's here, is to fix that problem in you. Well, there's a sense in which that has become about 90% of the preaching that I hear. Hmm. Uh, problems identified are different, but uh, and the solutions, but the solution is in one way or another sort of this is why Jesus came to be. This is why this is his main mission is you and your problems. I, if I had to characterize the book, I would think it's not only a kind of exercise in evangelism, mm-hmm. but it's also an exercise in uh, evangelism as vocation. Mm. Uh, theologically speaking, looking back, I suppose... I was concerned that we had detached salvation from vocation, that we had detached, uh, many of us preachers, we we had detached uh, being saved, uh, uh, being brought into God's righteousness and God's kingdom. We had detached that from the call of God. And as a note in the book, you know, Jesus came saying to people, not uh, where does it hurt, uh, where are your difficulties that you're facing in life, okay, good, well, that, that's, that, that's what I'm here to fix. No, mm-hmm. Jesus came preaching, follow me, yeah. and he, whatever he wanted to do, he said that he chose not to do what he wanted to do without us, without our help, without our discipleship. So, I think it's a book about vocation about what it's like to have your life swept up into the purposes of God. Yeah. And and you know as you were talking just now and and I'm hearing it all again uh, th- this isn't necessarily something you touched on in the book but but it really is too because the way that we so often uh, have preached the gospel it's easy for me to see why now uh, I'm especially seeing um like politics in America have become has become the religion of so many people because in many ways it sounds like the same sermons that people have been hearing like here's a need you have you know like you oh, you, you need this that's a good point. and yeah. and I and I'm going to give you that so you got to vote for me and you even hear it in you know like like Trump when he's out on on only I can fix it you know it's almost this yeah. whole like and, evangelistic tour type thing you know 
you know, there 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 was a day when evangelistic uh, so-called preachers. I mean, we we would say, uh, hey, uh, things are really in a mess in your life. Uh, things are dark. Things are terrible. Uh, hey, uh, come to church. Come be a Christian. Come to Jesus. You can get that fixed. It is interesting uh, how that kind of language has kind of morphed into politics where yeah. we say, oh, America's in a terrible mess. Mm-hmm. I, I know in Trump's inauguration speech, it was so dark. Yeah. It was apocalyptic. American and carnage. it was, we are living in the last days. It's just terrible. I'm going to do what I can to fix it, but uh, Obama's messed it up so bad, I don't know what I can do. And, and it, your point, it is fascinating how we have transferred that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'd say... Uh, I didn't articulate it this way in the book, but I have come to articulate it, that I'm afraid American Christians can't tell the difference anymore between being a Christian and an American. (laughs) There is no difference. And so we're just so worried about the country. Uh, We, the only way to get any good done is, is through politicians and electing the right politicians and all without any sense that, uh, to be a Christian is to have two passports in your pocket. Mm. Uh, to be a Christian is to have claims made upon you that the government can never make. It, it's also to believe that God's solution to what ails us is always deeper and more unimaginable than, than simply the government yeah. uh, or, or secular politics. Uh, and thus, the book kind of ends with uh, church <laughs> yeah. and talking about how the church is not just, you know, a nice, uh, helpful way to get other opinions and to, to get some supportive friends and all. Uh, church is, is sort of instrumental in, in your salvation. Yeah. In the, the church, to be cast in the church is the way Jesus uh, redeems us uh, by giving us a, a different family yeah. than the one that we were born into. Hmm. And and again, Church, I, I think you said something a few minutes ago um, along the lines of the, the dangers of detaching our salvation from vocation. Uh, so, something like that is what you had said. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think, again, it's, it's the Church that helps us to understand what that vocation is too um and what it means that that we actually have a place in this kingdom that we have a part to play um it yeah it's, it's not our story that we're telling it's god's story and yeah. he has graced us to be a part of this story and i i think that's fascinating too just kind of relating it to this idea of the political language that has become religious language and it's almost become like the church in so many ways and its failings has because we almost think well if we just yep. el- elect this guy well that's all i gotta do you know <laughs> they'll fix it it'll all be and, done uh, uh and so often we talk like, about jesus uh, that way i like what you say about that the church has a responsibility as the gift of being able to uh identify people as disciples i've, I've got a former student He's an African-American pastor out in eastern North Carolina, and he I saw a sermon of his online, and he said to his congregation, uh, you know, a month or so ago, you were just bagging groceries at the grocery store. Uh, you were just emptying bedpan at the nursing home. Well, that virus has made you into an heroic disciple. Hmm. And uh, if uh, you, you you now are out. You're, you're God's representative out on the front lines in in this pandemic. And it says, and by the way, if anybody thanks you for what you're doing, said so they probably won't. But he said, if anybody asks you, why are you going the second mile? Why are you doing this? Uh, that's your invitation. Hmm. You tell them, I'm here because Jesus put me here. I'm here. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, I thought it was wonderful. In fact, I, I guess, looking back on my own pastoral ministry, one gift I, that I am most proud of 
some of the things God did through this, but, but I wish I had more of it. And that was the gift as a pastor of being able to look at one of my church members and in a sense call them to ministry, call them to discipleship, hmm. to look at somebody and say, you know, George, you are so hard to get along with sometimes. You're a difficult board member, but because you are just so impatient. You're always wanting to see things happen now. Uh, well, uh, I'm putting you in charge of the church's food pantry, uh, and I want you to bring that impatience. I want you to make it a holy impatience. Mm. I want you yeah. to make this the best food pantry in town, okay? <laughs> and uh, though I've had those moments in my own ministry. They should have been more. And I think uh, one of the things people should expect of their pastor of their church is uh, to to say uh, uh, to say, "Wow, I believe the Lord is recruiting you for His work." Uh, you know, so often we come to church, we have a prayer list. Lord, here's your assignment for the week. Lord, uh, I want you to work on this and then fix this and then heal that. I, I think. As I read the Gospels, it's, it's much more of uh, the Lord saying, "Okay, here's what I'm, here's what I'm up to, here's what I'm engaged in." Now, guess who's going to help me bring this about? <laughs> guess who I'm assigning a role to to help make this happen? And I think that's what church ought to be: is where we gather on a weekly basis to get our marching orders mm. and to be strengthened for the jobs. Jesus has given us. Uh, I remember this woman told me that she had uh, organized a after-school tutoring program and at the local school, and she recruited volunteers uh, from a number of the churches nearby the school and all. And, but she said, I didn't get the right, a lot of cooperation from the principal of the school, and uh, sometimes the kids would be difficult, and the volunteers didn't always come through, and said, I just came out one Sunday, and I told my pastor, I said, I've just prayed. I just, I just think I'm going to have to give this up. It's just, it's just too stressful. It's just, I just don't think I can uh, uh, bear this burden anymore. And she said, my pastor said, don't come whining to me about stuff that Jesus asked you to do. Take it up with the Lord. <laughs> and said, you may not be as weak as you think you are. Mm. And he said, you think I enjoy being a minister, all a pastor all the time? He said, take it up with the Lord. He went, I sort of love that, yeah. you know, and and saying, uh, by the way, you, you're doing what you're doing in the kingdom, not because it necessarily brings you joy or satisfaction or fulfillment. You're doing it because it's a job that Jesus assigns you for reasons known only to Jesus. Hmm. Wow, that's a great, great story. You know, and, and I wonder sometimes, and I've I've seen it more clearly, I think, during this time of pandemic uh, than maybe I've ever seen it in my life. Um, I'm worried, uh, and I don't know how far down this rabbit trail we'll want to go, but it, as I've been thinking about this idea, you've been talking again about what it means to be discipled. Uh, and what it means to be discipled into the church. I fear that we have done such a poor job in the church in America of discipling people um, because I see so clearly how undisciple-like um, the church's people have been when it comes to something just as simple as like wearing a mask for the sake of another person, you know, and, mm -hmm. and what it would mean... Um, I, I heard somebody say at a, a conference one time that I was at with a, some other pastors a few years ago, and I was helping to lead some music at this conference, and one of the speakers said, if a person comes to your church for 20 years, um, how how different do they look because mm -hmm. they've been a part of your congregation and, and because they've worshipped with you? And, and you know, I've, I've been really... I've been really worried as of late because I see all the time people who claim to be followers of Jesus who who won't do the slightest thing 
um, to help another person because you're infringing on my rights. And and I always think that that sounds like such a non-gospel thing that we're so ingrained in the idea of my rights and my wants that we don't even care about those needs. And, and I just think this idea that you keep coming back to again, the idea that Jesus has called us to something so much greater. And, and I wonder if our preaching has just been too paltry. Um, you know, we, we focus so much on the things that you've talked about in this book of of just here's a need, almost like American consumerism. You've got a need. We've got the way to fix it, you know, <laughs> and instead. Uh, you... It is it is uh, American consumerism run wild. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it 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 I can un I can understand how we preachers have fallen into that, but I think it is we got to fight it, and and mainly because it is just not fair to the presentation of Jesus Christ that we get in the New Testament, yeah, uh, or to the church's historic witness uh, hmm. to Christ, and that is. Uh, I mean, for instance, one of the problems we have is that if you ask me, uh, what are your needs? Uh, well, uh, America, you know, is a, a place where we, our government is my rights, and uh, we, I have my rights. Uh, I'm, I'm born with those rights. And being an American means to exercise the maximum number of rights. Well, the trouble is, uh, we live in a polity where uh, my rights are, are basic, uh, are often my desires mm -hmm. that have gotten elevated in me to rights. Right. And my desires, uh, I, we, are, we are showing, are just a bottomless pit. And having fulfilled all the biblical needs like bread, uh, clothing, <laughs> housing, <laughs> Uh, we've done all that with our checkbook. We don't need to ask God. Most of us don't to do that. <laughs> so we've, we've moved on to have other needs like uh, uh, meaning in life or purpose in life, a reason to get out of bed in the morning, a, a sense of inner peace, and blah, blah, blah. And, and, uh, and we've been all too quick to say, uh, oh, 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 good. That's your, that's your biggest need? Well, well good. Uh, here's some Bible verses, or, or here's how uh, Jesus can can fulfill that need. Whereas I think many Christians could testify, uh, one, Jesus Christ doesn't solve your needs. He gives you needs you would have never had had not get, you hadn't met Jesus. Exactly. Uh, then uh, another thing is that many times... Uh, there are things in my life that I think I just must have uh, in order to be fulfilled in life that Jesus appears to have no interest in uh, providing me, and maybe he wants to give me a different life and different needs. Hmm. And so my need, rather than to have a, a sense of peace in my life, maybe he exchanges that for a need to, to make a difference in the world to connect with other people in ways uh, that make a difference uh, for them. Hmm. Uh, I was amazed during after the uh, Breonna Taylor uh, killing and Armand Aubrey and et cetera, et cetera, George, uh, et, et cetera. George Floyd, uh, yeah. I, George Floyd. I, I have, I've heard Christians say that, you know, they just felt so... Uh, uh, bereft and and so frustrated, so ashamed, and they uh, went to church, or for most of us in the last few months, logged into church, and uh, seeking some word, uh, some something of hope, something they could do that might help them respond to these. Uh, tragedies, these uh, this evil, and uh, nothing, yeah. nothing was mentioned at church, and uh, and I think th that those Christians yearning uh, 
I believe that was Holy Spirit induced. Mm-hmm. And woe be unto the church that, that, that is unable to say, uh, you're feeling upset, you're feeling in despair, uh, you're, you want to do something, well, you come to the right place. And uh, here, here's what we're going to do. And uh, you get to be part of it. And uh, so I hope this book is about some of that. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Well, you know, there's so much good to talk about in, in this little book. and um, I, But I think what I want to, to jump to tonight so we don't uh, spend the whole evening um, talking uh, and, and run out of time here, one thing that I know you're passionate about talking about, and you write about it some in the book, um, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And... Um, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about some of the ways that you think uh, the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, how he can speak to us today. Well, uh, in the book, I, I, I'm indebted to my own uh, kind of encounter with Bonhoeffer, some of Bonhoeffer's writing. Bonhoeffer, you know, was a brilliant intellect, and he ranged widely in his writing. But he made some comments about what does Christianity do with what he called the strong man? That is the contented, uh, fulfilled, reasonably happy individual uh, who has been blessed by life. What do we do with that person? Uh, and Bonhoeffer said, I'm, I'm disturbed by the way we often try to tear that person down saying, hey, you're not as happy as you think you are. <laughs> or sure, you 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 a lot of things are going well for you in your life, but but you're this isn't going well, and uh, you need help in this area. But uh, what does does Christ have any word for the strong? And and from that, Bonhoeffer himself grew up in a very patrician, privileged German family. He <clears throat> had the best uh, education uh, Germany had to offer. And in the 1930s, he, he got a job as a theologian at the Union Seminary. And he could have gladly, safely stayed at Union uh, throughout the war. But his war clouds gathered, and the situation in Germany became more apparent how, where it was going. And as Bonhoeffer's church, the German church, fell into the arms of Adolf Hitler, uh, Bonhoeffer made a decision to go back to Germany, feeling that God was leading him back there, hmm. feeling like to return to the crucible, to return to the fire, is exactly the kind of thing one would expect yeah. of a crucified Savior. And so he returned to Germany and uh, started a, a, a renegade uh, a seminary, uh, continued to write, eventually... Uh, uh, participated in a plot against Hitler, and he was uh, then uh, became a, a martyr. He was hung uh, just a few days before the end of the war. And uh, uh, to me, that model uh, spoke that hey, it's it's about discipleship. In fact, maybe his greatest book was the cost of discipleship, yeah. in which he talked about the peril of cheap grace, uh, mm-hmm. grace that is undemanding. I know after reading that book, I, I don't usually use the word, the phrase unconditional grace. Uh, I, I know what they're talking about and all. <laughs> it's just that I think Christ's grace, like love itself, comes to us with all kinds of demands mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and requires our transformation in order to be loved by this God, and in order to return that love. So, anyway, Bonhoeffer to me was a model of that. Yeah. Oh, that's that's so good. And um, when you just talked about, you know, the the love that has all this, these demands, um, and you had talked a while ago um, about a parent, too, and, and a parent that starts with, look, I love you. Um, but we also know that a parent who loves us says, and I do have these expectations of you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I want you, I want you to I, uh, be this way, and uh, and that's... You, uh, most of us, uh, the, the worst judgment we ever receive uh, in life 
the most severe correction we have received is from our parents. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, I, I remember a preacher saying, uh, uh, you know, parental love is, is demanding love. He said, I, I know grown men who to this day will, will not smoke in front of their mothers. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, you know, that, I think that is close to the kind of love of, I'm thinking like in the Exodus when God says, uh, I have created you out of nothing. I have brought you out of slavery. I have stuck with you and loved you. I have brought you uh, to this land flowing of milk and honey. Now, here's what I expect of my people. Mm. And the world is going to see what, what, what a great people you are. Uh, uh, by loving me, and uh, that again, evangelism. The word evangelism, you know, as you know, means good news. Mm -hmm. And it, um, the sad thing is, I think too often we preachers have transformed God's good news into human bad news. Yeah. About uh, here's one more burden you you got to assume. Uh, you know. Uh, I uh, was at a workshop a while back on spirituality, and uh, the speaker was talking about spiritual disciplines. And uh, you, you, you need to get up, uh, set aside time alone in the morning. And uh, before your children get up and all, and before you get involved in that, and then uh, and always start, always advise Bible study and significant portions of Bible study, and then... Uh, each evening, you know, before uh, sleep, you, you go through these prayers and, and these Bible readings and all. And then during the day, uh, set aside at least two or three times a day where you stop and you pray. And, uh, and uh, when the speaker was finished, uh, one of the members of the group said, uh, you know, why are you doing all that? Just Just remember to be in love. Mm. <laughs> you know, just, just remember that by the way, uh, this is about not about all the stuff you got to do, but it's about the incredible links God and Jesus Christ has gone uh, to get you. Hmm. And if to lose sight of that is uh, it is a sad perversion of the gospel. Damn. So, uh, uh, and the yeah. well, I, I do. <laughs> Uh, I wonder what being a Methodist, a Methodist coming out of John Wesley, and John Wesley felt like there were just some things about the spiritual life that were just too important to be left to chance to when you feel like it. So there was a method, and you mm -hmm. need to follow that method. No. However, sometimes Methodists have forgotten that, you know, it all begins with this heartwarming experience on Aldersgate Street when Wesley realized, wow, God has died for my sin. Yeah. Uh, even mine. And this sense of grace just flooding into his life and uh, his, it, his heart that's strangely something warmed. We, yes. And uh, well, uh, thank you for talking about the book oh man my and, my goodness it's such an honor uh, rick i'm i'm really moved too that you got the first edition <laughs> and uh <laughs> it is amazing it's gratifying at this point in my life to something that i worked on that long ago uh still maybe can be helpful yeah uh, to the church well, and uh but maybe it means that you know, struggling with the wonder of the gospel uh, and struggling with the wonder of that God has called us, of all people, uh, to be uh, God's agents mm -hmm. in the world, uh, that, that that has to be continually refurbished yeah. in, in every church and in every Christian's life. Hmm. Well, you know, the, I, I do think that there is still a lot of relevance in this book, and I'm I'm glad to have rediscovered it because um, until 
um, y'all reached out to me a few days ago and asked if we wanted to discuss it. I, I had had it on my shelf, but I hadn't revisited it in, in some time. And uh, as I was looking through it again, I thought, yeah, this is there's a lot I need to dig back into in this book. And I, I wonder if maybe we could close tonight by having you read uh, a section of the book that we talked about a little bit before we started recording. Okay. I'd, I'd love to to let our listeners uh, just hear a piece of this. Um, there's a great parable uh, that that you write uh, in the chapter "Standing on Our Own Two Feet," and we've talked a, a bit tonight about being parents and comparing the the being a parent to who God is and the love of God. And uh, this is actually a very interesting parable to me because it it has to do with um, a, a young lion who gets separated from his parents. Uh, but it, it really does clearly shine sort of uh, this, it, it's a great gospel story. And I wonder if in closing tonight, you would mind reading that parable okay. to our listeners. Yeah, I, I, it's a parable. Uh, and I, I think it, it has something to do with sort of uh, converting, repenting, coming into the faith, uh, which I talk about as a kind of waking up. Uh, but here it is. Uh, once there was a little lion who lived in the jungle. He was born into a noble family of lions, king, a beast. Uh, but when this little lion was still a baby, something happened one night which caused him to get separated from his parents, from his family. I don't know what caused the separation, maybe an earthquake, a blinding storm. Uh, at any rate, the little lion woke up the next morning to find himself all alone. He began to wander through the jungle looking for his family, home. Finally, after walking a very long time, he came upon a flock of sheep grazing in the meadow. He came out of the jungle and watched them as they were eating the green grass. This must be my family, the little lion said to himself. I'll go over there and join them. The little lion went over, joined the sheep. The sheep paid him little attention. He was so small, just blended in with them. The little lion watched the sheep as they ate the grass and he tried to copy them. He wanted to be just like them. Uh, he didn't like his first few mouthfuls of grass. His neck started to hurt, bending over. Uh, but by working at it, he got the hang of it. He could eat grass with the other sheep. And he also worked on saying, ba, uh, like the other sheep. And, but his ba just never sounded <laughs> quite right. It, it bothered him that his fur didn't seem to grow as long and woolly as the other sheep. Uh, but they were all too busy eating grass and following the leader to notice him. And the little lion just kept eating grass and following the leader. And uh, he was starting to feel right at home. Then one day something happened, which changed all that. While the flock was out grazing in the meadow, a loud, thundering, earth-shaking roar came out of the jungle. The sheep immediately stopped eating and huddled together in fear. They then stepped out of the jungle, a gigantic noble lion. He gave out another roar. The leader of the sheep uh, started running as fast as his little legs could carry him, and all the other sheep followed. But something told the little lion not to run with the other sheep. Something fascinated him about the majestic-looking figure emerging from the jungle. He was frightened, but also drawn toward him. Then the big lion let out another roar, spoke to the little lion. What in the world do you think you're doing? Who, me? responded the little lion. Yes, you. What are you doing? Wandering around with those sheep and eating grass, saying, bah, you look ridiculous. You sound ridiculous. But I'm supposed to eat the grass and say, bah, said the little lion. All the sheep do it. You are not a sheep. Not a sheep? asked the little lion in complete puzzlement. No. Just look at yourself. Come over here. Look at yourself in this pool of water. The little lion timidly edged over to the pool of water. He stood at its edge and gazed into the water. To his utter amazement, he saw there not a white woolly sheep, but a small lion. Uh, not as big and strong as a big lion, but nevertheless, a lion. See, said the big lion, those teeth, those eyes, that fur, you, those aren't the sheep's. But you're one of us. You're a lion. He was right. The little lion could see that he was right. The little lion realized all this time he'd been trying to be something he wasn't, 
something he didn't really want to be. From that moment on, the little lion became a real lion. He learned to roar and hunt and tame the jungle with the best of the lions. He learned to stand on his own two feet, not simply to follow the leader of the flock. He discovered who he was and what he was meant to be. Hmm. Somewhere, there's a lesson for each of us. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. 1 John 3, 1. Fantastic. Well, listeners, you can tell from just hearing that uh, one short section of the book that it's really worth going out and trying to find a copy of, uh, of this new edition of the book, The Gospel for the Person Who Has Everything by William Willimon. And uh, the new edition is released by Paraclete Press. And uh, I'm very excited about that for you. I'm glad that they have uh, re-released it. We're going to have uh, links to the book and to Dr. Willimon's site on our website at voicesinmyheadpodcast.com. And and uh, you can just easily click there and uh, you'll be able to find all of the links that will take you to everywhere uh, that, that William Willimon has his books and uh, other things that he has going along uh, in his life. So it's been a real honor to, to get to talk to you again this evening and, and I thank you for the opportunity to discuss this book. And um, I, as I say to my guests every week, I'm going to say it to you again, Dr. William Willimon, thank you for being one of the voices in my head this week. Uh, thank you, Rick. Great to be with you again. Thank you for joining me here this week on Voices in My Head. I hope you'll visit me on my website at rickleejames.com where you can find out more about me, get my music on vinyl and CD, follow my blog, and even schedule me for a concert or a speaking engagement. Better yet, even a book signing in your neighborhood. You can find all that and more at rickleejames.com. Also, it would mean a great deal to me if you could write a review of this podcast on iTunes. The more positive reviews that we receive, the more visible this podcast will be online. And now, for the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. God bless you, and thank you for listening to Voices in My Head.